This Restoration Today podcast is presented by KnowHow. KnowHow helps growing restoration companies standardize their operations so they can scale faster and more profitably without the chaos. As a leading process communication platform, KnowHow's mission is to help restoration companies unlock the full potential of their workforce. For more information, visit TryKnowHow.com. Welcome to a fresh episode of the Restoration Today podcast. Hey, if you're liking what you hear, please leave us a review. We would really appreciate it. Hey there, thanks for checking out this episode of the Restoration Today podcast. I am your host, Michelle Blevins, the publisher of CNR Magazine. And today I am very excited to be talking about a topic that is probably one of the biggest topics in the restoration industry today. It is undoubtedly the biggest pain point that restorers are facing. And we are talking about the labor shortage and how we overcome it. So I am very excited to be joined by Leighton Healy. He is the CEO of KnowHow, and he is spearheading in a study on the workforce in the industry and really talking to those technician level employees across the industry on what makes them tick. Why do they like the industry? What don't they like about their jobs? How can we make this industry more attractive to workers moving forward? So Leighton, thank you very much for joining me. I'm going to just toss it right over to you to start um, by having you introduce yourself and we can just kind of go from there. Yeah, absolutely, Michelle. It's a pleasure to be with you. Thanks for the opportunity to spotlight what is a very important project. And we're not alone. You know, there's a number of uh, industry leading uh, familiar faces who are involved in this important work. You know, yourself and, and the team at CNR. The team at Business Mentors, Violin, Nasgami, Restoration Technical Institute, the law offices of Ed Cross, r r Magazine. You know, there's a, there's a long list of individuals who recognize what we've known for a long time, that the biggest challenge has been hiring and retention in this industry. You know, you wrote an article in November 2019, mm-hmm. uh, really specifying, just, just really nailing it on the head, that hiring and retention is one of the biggest challenges in this industry. Now, what, we've, what we haven't known with any real depth is what can we do about it, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. And so know how, very simply put, is uh, we are a workforce communication platform for growing restoration companies. You know, our, our mission is, is really we want to help restoration companies unlock the full potential of their workforce. You know, the workforce is changing. There's a lot of changes, you know, we can talk about that today. We really spend a lot of time thinking about how we help restorers really prepare for the workforce of the future. And uh, and so, yes, we are leading the largest survey ever conducted of the, of the North American restoration workforce. And the purpose of this survey is, is really this, Michelle, we wanna understand what industry leaders need to do to be able to sustainably attract, you know, retain, qualified workers and really create a work experience that motivates them to see a a career in the industry. And there's a lot of big, powerful waves and shifts in the, in the marketplace. There's a lot of inflection points that, that uh, I would say some, some will help the industry and some will really uh, throw many companies into a tailspin if they don't take this seriously. So thanks for having us here. Yeah. So what does the future workforce look like to you? I think the pandemic had a lot to do with kind of shaping what things look like right now. People have gotten more used to working from home and we're going through the great resignation and people are like, oh, I can do things on my own now. More people are choosing to kind of freelance their way through work, right? Instead of going to work for a specific company. So what does the workforce of the future really look like to you in your eyes? So let's, yeah, let's, let's break down some things that are, that have been really well researched. So some of the most significant demographic changes coming to the North American workforce, specifically the blue collar service workforce. That's where we want to just drill in because, you know, not every industry is responding to things the same. You know, uh, I, I'm in the kind of, I guess you call it like the, the, the technology industry and, uh, and absolutely, you know, remote work is, is, uh, is here to stay. Um, but if we look specifically at the blue collar industry, let's look at some of these big trends. Number one, the, U, the, the U.S. workforce and the Canadian workforce, they're aging, but they want to continue to work. Right. And so that's that's, you know, in part because of low birth rates. But it's also because uh, as people uh, get older and they enjoy health longer and just absolutely some of the the the, the, uh, the let's all the wake of the pandemic is that some people need to work longer, practically speaking. And so the workforce um, is, is aging. 
Now, another trend is that it's going to begin to see an up, just a, just a groundswell of young people who have less practical experience working with their hands than ever before. Mm -hmm. Another trend is that it's th that the workforce is going to become increasingly more diverse. You know, that's immigration patterns, but that's also uh, as more women move into blue collar roles that are more traditionally associated with men. And so that's a factor as well. And then you're also seeing just a, an increasing rise of education. And so as education, we can have a whole conversation about the impact of education, rising education rates on blue collar roles. Sometimes there's a stigma in educated groups that, well, blue collar is not for the educated groups. And so companies that are really coming forward with really strong training and development and, and those types of programs and really um, positioning their companies as an employer of choice, as a professional organization, are attracting a lot of that upswell of, of an of a increasingly higher educated workforce. Yeah, we can talk about, you know, the millennials and the Gen Zs, but those are some of the big themes. So what are some ways that you see, and I know some of this is going to come out of the survey, but what are some ways that you see that the restoration industry specifically can make some adjustments to become more attractive to these, um, these candidates, no matter what generation they are? Right, absolutely. And so one would be is that, um, again, if we just, we, we can dig into any of these, Michelle, if you want. But one of the first ones is, is that sometimes in high turnover industries like, like construction, like restoration, is that sometimes you can just, you can kind of expect your staff to be exposed, like kind of ex expendable, right? Mm -hmm. And, uh, and so there's, a, there's an understandable, you know, kind of reluctance sometimes to provide high quality training and support and, and, and really, I would say guidance, because who knows if they're going to be here in like six to nine months. And so that has to change. You know, employers are going to have to consistently take the leap of faith. Right. And, you know, there's we probably all heard that old adage, you know, what if I invest all this training in my team and they leave? And I mean, the response is well, what if you don't and they stay, right? And, uh, and so that's really one of the key things is that in all cases, change is coming to the industry. Young people with less experience are coming in, they need training and development. Mm -hmm. People are coming, are, are staying in the industry, right? Or are, are choosing the industry as a, as a second career. A lot of the franchise purchases that are happening in, in the industry, the actual franchise locations, um, increasingly aren't, 20 somethings buying a franchise, they're 50 somethings looking for their second career. Mm -hmm. And those individuals have a, a high education curve to go through as well. And so we're going to see the restoration industry experience multi generational workplace dynamics that has to be powered by software um, and, and, and driven by an increasingly, you know, um, I would say more and more hurried pace than ever before. Yes. Okay. So um, what role do you think technology is going to play in um, drawing people in, especially younger generations? I mean, you know, millennials and then Gen Zers, it's like all mobile, right? Like it's all technology mm -hmm. based. So um, what direction does the restoration industry need to go? This is a big topic right now, right? Like okay. there needs to be more collaboration. There needs to be more integration. Stuff needs to be easier to use out in the field. It needs to talk to each other better. So what do you see um, as needing to happen in the industry to really make the technology here attractive and workable for future generations? Yeah, that's a good question. I mean, uh, I, I, I think that uh, 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 someone who's been in the industry for, I haven't been in the industry for say 30 years, but someone who has, uh, I can imagine that they have just seen like a deluge of new technologies come, come and go. So the first thing I would say is let's, let's look at a higher, just maybe just a, a higher, more powerful trend. And so number one, Google, Amazon, Facebook, you know, Twitter, um, you name those big companies, they have thousands of engineers that they pay a quarter million dollars a year or more mm -hmm. to, to create technology that trains our staff that knowledge and information should be easy and it should serve me and it should be personalized to me. And so the number one thing is that 
nothing is going to be more powerful than what's called that consumer technology trend that's being driven forward by the big five. And, uh, and they're increasingly going to make technology that teaches us how to interact with information. And so regardless of how beautiful your binder is or how fantastic your SharePoint folder is, you know, at the end of the day, it's not going to withstand the tsunami of consumer technology trends. And so your workers are going to be coming to this industry, old, young, expecting that, that tools uh, serve them, not that they have to just, you know, fight with this thing every day. Um, the other thing, another big trend is because so much of the software is what's, what's what we call the species of software as a service, so SaaS. And so software as a service, the trend, uh, it doesn't matter who whose report you read, uh, it's increasingly going towards best in class software for particular usage. So everyone wants deeply, deeply, you know, I would call it integrated unifying software, but the trend is best in class, best in class tool software, best in class, you know, sorry, photo software, best in class this. Yeah. And so a lot of trends, Michelle, show that about the average company in about seven to eight years will probably subscribe to about 200 different software products. So when you think about, I'm having a hard time getting my worker to use six or seven, what if they had a hundred? Now, I mean, that's where, uh, that's where tools like Know How show up is that we believe that um, you need a tool that unifies everything and, and, and basically says, this is how everything fits together. And we believe that other software companies uh, realize that their tool is best utilized when the worker knows when to use it and how to use it, right? And and, and so, you, you know, industries are, are starting to see the emergence of, of what you call these these kind of communication platforms, these kind of workflow communication platforms. So, I mean, that's a that's a big that's a big trend that's that's happening. And yeah, I mean, staff today, uh, there's a big theme called digital empowerment. And digital empowerment is that you know to a to a to a worker nowadays, nothing is more overwhelming and more of a turnoff than standing in a foot of water in a customer's basement with with their with their mobile device in their hand and all the resources of Google and YouTube and everything, but they're just alone for guidance because they don't know who to call. There's no way to access that company's, you know, um, systems, you know, um, and they've really just been kind of left there to, 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 to kind of wing it. And, uh, and that just won't cut it anymore. So how do you decide on your research every year? Like last year, you guys did research on reviews, right? And you did the 10,000 review, bad reviews. And here's what we found out, right? So how do you decide on your research every year? How did you decide on last year? And how did you decide on this year? Yeah, no, it's a great question. So we did. We, we looked at a, a data set that, that um, sometimes is, is, is passed over, which is when you see these one-star reviews, how much impact does that have on my bottom line? Like, do, do online reviews even have an impact? And we found out that it has an enormous impact, you know. In fact, you know, when you think of a, of a management team that puts all this time and effort and, and money and they, they go in and they do this large getaway management retreat and they plan out the year. I mean, that a lot of people would say can generally lead to about a 10 to 12 percent um, impact on, on the next year's performance. Um, then if you skipped it, we also found that like one one star review can have can almost undo all of that. Right. So to answer your question, why, why do we pursue that? Well, a big part of it is that we know that one of the things that creates bad customer experiences is uh, breakdown, breakdowns in communication, breakdowns in workflow, breakdown in process, breakdown in promise, you know, breakdown, you know, there's this, there's a saying that, you know, margins bleed between the handoffs between departments and companies. And, uh, and so we really, Michelle said, you know what, that, that online review is probably, you know, the, the, the top elevator floor in what happens when a company um, is, a, is a human dependent company and not a process driven company. And so as a, as, a, as a process communication and system communication system, we were very keen to learn what are the major reasons um, why customers complain, because we can essentially reverse engineer that and find out, you know, where did the wheels fall off the wagon and, and try to do something about it. So we selected it because we thought it was ultimately, um, I guess you'd call it the, 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 the bottom floor on, on, on the Y tree of wh why is this happening, right? Mm -hmm. The second thing you asked is why are we doing this topic? Mm -hmm. 
And we're doing this topic because we think that it has impacted every company in the industry. And there has been a lot of, I would say, um, recognition that it's a problem, but there really hasn't been what I would say is a, a substantial investment in finding out what to do about it. Yeah. Um, and so that's, that's mm-hmm. a big part of it. The, the second reason, Michelle, is that, you know, in, in the conversation of improving um, the, or, or understanding the workforce in the industry, um, our perspective is, is that one of the voices that just really has not had their turn at the microphone is the technician, is the frontline worker. Mm-hmm. And uh, I, I, hey, I'm a business owner, you know, our clients are business owners, you know, they are motivated, solid uh, business owners. We've had our voices heard, you know, we, it is hard to find and retain good people, right? It is very painful when a competitor nabs an all-star. Yep. But at the end of the day, we felt that, I guess we kind of recognize, I should say, that a lot of the people who are the hands and feet of this industry, Michelle, do not seem to have really had the opportunity to say, what are some aspects of your job that could be better, you know, or, you know, or, you know, you know, what are some, uh, you know, some, uh, some, some aspects of the d- dynamic between you and your manager that are working really well. And so a lot of it is being able to put a, uh, give a microphone to arguably the individuals we're all trying to find. And then the third thing is, oh yeah, we are a workforce software product and it is our desire and it's our mission to be able to help our clients to be able to win with the workforce uh, and, and, and it's an evolving workforce. And so um, that's a big part of it. All of our partners, Michelle, um, they're individuals that play a really important role in supporting the industry. And mm-hmm. they recognize that this is a big pain point as well. And so they want to help their customers uh, and use this information to make sure their services are, 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 are just, you know, sharp and pointed and relevant. And also, I think our partners, they, they want to get this information out. They want to get it out there because they know that uh, awareness is really the first step in making di- making a difference. So who, so you talked about this a little bit in one of, in part of your answer there, but who is the target demographic of this? This is not a survey that's going to owners, right? Normally that's where these surveys are going. Normally it's owners or, you know, upper management ops, GM, whatever, taking stuff like this. So this time this is different. So who are you hoping is going to get involved and complete this survey? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, we are looking for individuals who, are, who do not have manager on their title, right? Mm-hmm. And so really, um, you know, if you were to ask someone and say, and who reports to you, if they respond, they shouldn't take the survey, right? You know, at the end of the day, we're looking for, Michelle, we're looking for, um, in an organization, call it the 80-20, you know, you kind of have that 20% band who represent uh, supervisors, managers, office managers, VPs, those individuals, they need to see the results of the survey and take it in and say, that's a best practice. We're doing that pat on the back. We do not do a good job of that. Understood. You know what I'm saying? So those people need to receive the results when we bring those out in kind of the first part of Q2 next year. Um, But the participants, we want them to be the individuals who are the hands and feet of, of making this industry move forward. So the way I would think about it is, look, we can't get a sizable Demo, like a sizable data set, unless the industry kind of locks arms and says, look, it's anonymous. Okay. We're not mm-hmm. going to drag out anyone's laundry, right? It's anonymous. Yep. It takes 10 minutes. Staff can win a bunch of free cool prizes. They can go home with some sweet power drills and stuff like that and just let their voice heard, be heard. And, uh, and ultimately, you know, it'll give us an opportunity to look at it and say, um, you know, what are the trends here? What are the themes here? And, uh, you know, we can't do everything. But you know what, if we could do 10 things and if the average company could do six things, you know what, I'm telling you, like there is some significant opportunities that could be unlocked. So can you give um, people who haven't taken this yet an example of a few of the questions that are on there, a few of the things that you're going to be asking to give them a feel for it? I was really impressed by the breadth of things that you ask within just 10 minutes. It really does just take 10 minutes. It's very simple Mm -hmm. to go through, but you really cover a lot in there. You really are going to drive home a lot of the areas that companies could work on, a lot of the areas that matter. Mm -hmm. So can you give people a few examples of what you're asking? 
Yeah, absolutely. And, uh, you know, anyone who wants to do the survey or, or share it with your team, restorationsurvey.net, restorationsurvey.net, send them the link, giant, enormous button, take survey, right? <laughs> um, so, yeah, I would say the themes align with, with a lot of the trends. So, for example, one of the things that the industry knows it needs to work on is diversity, right? And diversity can be a loaded question or a loaded word, I should say, for a lot of people. But ultimately, the reality is, is that, um, you know, we, we, we need to cast a, a wider net in terms of who we attract into the industry. So an example of a question is, you know, what if, if anything does your company do to make it a great place for women to work, right? It's, you know, and, uh, you know, it's an interesting open-ended question, Right. A lot of us are familiar with very established systems like the net promoter system, right? Even just the ability for us to get 10,000 people to say on a scale of one to 10, you know, you know, how likely would you be to recommend where you work to a friend or family member? At the end of the day, we don't have that data, right? And so there's what I would call is more um, response style questions. And then there's more, um, let's call it, you know, use your own um, subjective experience working at that company to, to give a rating. And then there's more, um, I would say, like, um, inspirational questions like, um, you know, if you could be the boss for a day, what's one thing you would change, right? Mm -hmm. And sometimes, um, you know, some questions might thematically sound similar, but mm -hmm. anyone who's spent time really developing, uh, I would say, um, really, um, you know, following a, uh, like a survey methodology to develop something, you have slight variances on questions, because mm -hmm. you're trying to kind of just probe out of someone an, an honest response. Um, and, uh, you know, under the banner of anonymity, some people um, still need a little bit of encouragement that you're safe. Your comments um, will be, will be, uh, will, will not be shared with your manager, with your employer. And there's a lot of good stuff that people are going to share. Mm -hmm. And there's some stuff that we need to work on. So those are some examples, but Hey, best thing, way to do it is just, you know, take 10 minutes and, and take it for a test drive. So this is a big undertaking. You know, I, you have a website, you have the survey developed, and now a lot of the questions are open-ended. It's going to take a long time to weed through all of that and sort it all and figure out what it all means, right? What does this look like behind the scenes at KnowHow? I mean, this is, <laughs> you have to, you must have some resources dedicated to this. So what does it look like? Oh, yeah. No, that's a great question. I mean, whenever you're looking at that type of data analysis, you know, um, you know, analysis, it's a big, big component of what we are. We've always been a research driven software company. And so, you know, it's familiar territory for us. But yeah, let's make no mistake. This is a lot of content. You know, this is not the type of thing you want to print off or send to Kinko's. It's a, that's a big bill, right? Mm -hmm. So the first thing is, is you have analysts, right? So you have analysts that understand how to work with this type of information. Now, Sometimes when you're working with information of this size, um, you're really, really trying to, you know, you're not going to send somebody 7,000 responses of, you know, what's one thing that, um, you know, my, my company could do to make my onboarding experience better. You know what I mean? Like that's, you know, re reading a book of just responses is, is not really functional. So a lot of it, Michelle, is themes, right? A lot of it is, is uh, in a sense, if you were to think about um, creating, you know, half a dozen you know, digital buckets, right, for each question and beginning to digitally toss things in buckets and understand the themes and really dig into each bucket and understand at a deeper level, you know, really what's going on here. You know, we're not trying to, you know, chocolate and vanilla everything, but mm -hmm. at the end of the day, um, there are themes, right? Sometimes there's themes around communication. For example, when we looked at hundreds and hundreds of one-star reviews, and I'll tell you, there were some spicy ones, right? Um, you know, um, I imagine holy smokes, you know, from marital infidelity to, you know, um, filling my walls full of dry, like, wall, like, like sawdust, you know, I mean, it was unbelievable. Right. But anyways, um, you know, you can't get too stuck in the weeds. And so we really distilled it down to six. There's six common things that cause a customer, you know, to basically pick up their keyboard and just punish a restoration company, you know? And so similarly, we'll, we'll take that same approach because our outcome, Michelle, is not to create this like big, meaty, you know, academic treatise, right? Our goal is to create things that are functional for decision makers and leaders to be able to look at it and say, well, I can do that, right? And so, you know, uh, you know, if you look at a giant funnel, 
yeah, it's it's you know it's it's a layer of analysis. It's a, it's a layer of more analysis. It's it's you know board dis, you know room discussions, and then it's and then ultimately it comes down to um, you know kind of what I would call is a is a uh, is a is a is a is a, a tr- approachable data set, right? With um, with themes and 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 trends and patterns, and then that's an opportunity for us to be able to look at that data and uh, and ourselves and our partners and work to try to make some decisions and, and, and launch some initiatives that uh, we hope will, you know, raise all boats. So by the time that people see this podcast, the survey is going to be live. It is live now. But um, mm-hmm. so by the time people, if you see this, you can take it. So send it yep. and get people to take it, right? Yep. Um, there's been a lot of behind the scenes work coming up till now. So what kind of support have you gotten in the background? You talked about it a little bit at the beginning, but what kind of support have you been getting in the background already with restoration companies being excited about it? Some of the big players, I think, being excited about it right now, plus all of these mm-hmm. other um, organizations and educators and stuff like that. What does that look like? Yeah, no, it's, it's uh, you know, this is one of those lock arms together. Like mm-hmm. this is, um, you know, this is, uh, this is, this is a, an industry engagement. And so, what we have is we have really, um, let, let's just keep it simple. We have two kind of groups that are collaborating with us. First, we have what we call workforce champions. So we're calling them workforce champions. A workforce champion is a restoration company who recognizes that, that the biggest challenges in our industry are workforce challenges. And they're saying, you know what, I'm going to put my hand up and I'm going to do something about it. I'm going to, as someone with influence in my company, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna get my staff to complete this anonymous survey, and uh, and so those workforce champions, we recognize them. They're on the landing page. You know, we're we're gonna be putting out kind of a summary of all of this research to the industry in the new year, and and they'll be recognized as as a as a workforce champion, someone who really cares about this, and uh, and they'll also get you know some of the, the 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 raw results you know from from some of the regions they operate in, right? They're not gonna see. Oh, I know who that is. It's all anonymized. Yeah. So those are workforce champions. And you're right. Uh, some of just the, the real titans in the industry uh, are coming on board. And you know what? And we got some, uh, some, some mid-sized companies and smaller companies yeah. that want to get involved. The other side is what we call our communication partners. These are individuals like, like the great CNR, right? You know, mm-hmm. these are organizations who, at the end of the day, like we rely on them as, as communication leaders or vendors in the industry and they provide services and products and, uh, and, and information to the industry that, that we use to, to make decisions on a daily basis. And so they are currently rubbing shoulders with the business owners who run this industry. And so communication partners that join us, they are helping to get the word out to try to get their clients' businesses to be able to, to, to push this down to their staff. And then in turn, you know, we're supporting those communication partners by bringing them in and, and allowing them to access that data set um, so that they can use it to improve their own services and products and, and share those insights. So it's um, workforce champions, you know, companies who, who, who want this type of information and then communication partners who, who really understand that we need to lock arms together to get this word out. Perfect. All right. How long is the survey going to be live? How long do people have to take it? Yeah. So, um, Number one is get on it right away because we have some early bird prizes. So one of the things we've done to kind of sweeten things up a little bit is that um, uh, every time that a person you know completes the survey, just complete it once, is you get entered into a draw. We've got a whole bunch of prizes from power tools to sports memorabilia to hunting gear, like you know, so you can win a bunch of stuff. And so we're going to do our first early bird dry, uh, prize draw. Um, I believe uh, the the second last week of December. So by end of, by December 19th, it's a Sunday, end of day, you know, get your staff to complete it if they want to be in that early bird prize. And then pretty much following that um, up until we're, we're anticipating Michelle, it'll roll into probably the first part of February, depending on, on respondents, respondents, like the volume of respondents and, uh, and all along the way, pretty much every week. um, Yeah. We'll be like giving out some free prizes for people taking time out of their day to fill this thing out. Perfect. All right. Anything else you want to share? I want to throw out there that people will be able to see the results ideally, or like a summary of them in the March slash April issue of CNR. It's likely going to be the cover story. And that issue is going to be at a ton of trade shows. So people who aren't subscribed to CNR, subscribe now, cnrmagazine.com. But you'll also be able to pick it up at RIA, Contractor Connection, Access, 
I don't even know. All of the spring shows yeah. that she will be at, right? So you will be able to find out a lot of that and then get a link to access the full review report from there. But anything else that you want to share that we haven't touched on? Well, I, I, first, I want to just, I just want to just highlight what you just said is absolutely, we're super excited that CNR Magazine uh, is going to be kind of having that breaking story when we have those results in. And so that, you know, if you're saying, man, I really want to be able to understand like what the result of this is, this is it. Subscribe to CNR, get it, get your hands on it. Right. Because nope. you're not going to want to be that, that lame person who's like, Hey, can I get your copy? Right. So anyways, I, I agree. You know, you're going to want to do that. So I'm excited for that. You know, I think that one of the first things, the, the last thing I would say is this, the biggest threats facing the industry are also the biggest opportunities. And they are workforce challenges. You know what? Um, I'll, I'll spare you the details. At the end of the day, there are a lot of things that um, are going to, 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 to drive the industry forward. 2024, by most estimations, you know, the construction industry as a whole could see as much as a 24% bump, right? In terms of, in terms of acceleration. Mm -hmm. And if you layer on to that, all of the stimulus that governments are most likely going to drive to be able to drive things forward, um, you know, coming out of this slump, you know what, it's going to be big. But here's the problem. The problem is, is that if you cannot attract, retain good staff, you are going to be stuck paying way too much for labor costs. You're going to be scrapping over the same, you know, small, increasingly smaller, smaller pool of individuals who are willing to work for a company that doesn't take workforce seriously. Right. And you're going to begin, you know, increasingly experiencing delays on your projects and you're going to have really some fed up customers, fed up insurance providers. And so at the end of the day, if you've always been kind of dragging your feet and making the workforce and really creating that 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 world class worker experience, if you if you haven't taken that right to the top of the agenda, I would say do it. Become a workforce champion. Get your staff to do this. Read the research and. uh and, uh, and, and you know what, don't do it all. Just choose two or three things and, uh, and choose to make some, some uh, investments in your workforce next year. I love that. There was a lot of truth in there. Gone are the days of just winging it with your workforce, right? And hoping that people are going to work for you. That is not how it works anymore. So I love it. All right. Like, well, thank you so much. Um, everybody can go to restorationsurvey.net. I'm pretty sure that that's what you said. And they can go to cnrmagazine.com. There's also going to be links on there. So you'll be able to find it everywhere. I'm pretty sure that there are going to be links to this everywhere and people will be able to easily find it. So Thank you very much for your time. I appreciate it. Be on the lookout for results after the survey is done. I'm sure Leighton and I will have a follow-up conversation on the results and we'll go from there. Thank you, sir. I appreciate it. Yeah, you're welcome, Michelle. Have a great day. For more restoration today, visit our website, cnrmagazine.com or find us wherever you get your favorite podcasts.